So the first thing we're going to talk about is Galatians and Paul to this community. And it's going to be important to keep in mind some of the things we talked about last time, some of the encounters that he had with the Galatians. And Galatia is going to be the, town, the cities of Pisidian Antioch, um, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, those cities. And so it'll be important to kind of remember some of the things that happened. And hopefully this will not cut things off. But um, So Galatians. The first thing to mention, this is the map just to remind you of the area we're talking about. Ephesus, Colossa, all that is in this same region. But he's particularly going to talk to that first group of people that he met in the city of Antioch, Lystra, Derby, Iconium. So when was the book of Galatians written? Scholars debate this. There's going to be various opinions. There's two key groups to determine, that make, an, make a common statement about when it was written. There's one group that's an earlier writing and one group's late. One group says it was written when Paul, um, years later, years after he visited there. But another group, and this is uh, my professor, Dr. Tim Gray, he was kind of in this leaning, and I think there's a lot of evidence for this, and we'll show that it was probably earlier that he probably wrote this around 48 to 49 A.D., right after his first mission trip. So he went on that first missionary trip, and then if you recall, immediately after that, there starts to be some arguments with people, Jewish Christians coming in, teaching you have to be circumcised to be Christian. So when they start raising these arguments, this starts spreading throughout the communities, and Paul starts to hear that the Galatians are now being exposed to this, and that the Galatians now are starting to change the way of thinking and that they're starting to follow these people preaching, you must be circumcised. And so then they end up having the Council of Jerusalem. Well, some of the scholars think that as Paul was on his way to this Council of Jerusalem, he writes the letter to the Galatians to tell them, don't listen to this teaching, it's wrong. He never mentions in the letter to the Galatians that a, that a council was ever held. And so that's one clue that you would think that if there's this big dispute among them about whether or not you're circumcised, he would have at least brought up, remember what we decided at the council in Jerusalem, that this wasn't necessary, but he never does. So there's a lot of scholars that think because he's not, that's one clue this was written early, just before the council. Another thing is you'll see at the very beginning of the letter, he's going to tell them, why have you so quickly turned from what I taught you? If it was years later, it doesn't make complete sense that he's using that terminology. So there's some clues that was written early. It doesn't ultimately matter when we're reading this and interpreting what, he, what he's telling us, but it is something that can be helpful to understand what's happening. And so I'm kind of of the view that it probably was written early by those two clues, plus a few of the things that he says and did. Um, but just know there is a little debate whether it was written around this time or a few years later. The audience is primarily the Galatians. Now there's a message for all of us and for all Christians, but it was primarily this community in the area of Galatia. One of the things that you'll notice if you look at the very beginning of the, the letter, Paul in most of his letters writes in the Greco-Roman style of writing letters. And so typically at the very beginning you're going to have, an, the author's going to introduce himself, give you some clue as to who's writing it, and then there's going to be a greeting, and then typically there's a thanksgiving, being thankful for something. When the letter to the Galatians there is no thanksgiving. Paul writes to let them know he's the author of this letter. And so you can see that at the very beginning in, the, in verse 1. And then he gives a greeting to the people of Galatia. But he never writes a thanksgiving. He jumps right to his point in verse 6. And why does he do this? Well, because he's frustrated with them. He realizes they're already turning away from what he had preached and taught them. So he has nothing to be thankful for, in a sense, in his mind, because they're already abandoning the gospel he taught them. And so from the beginning of verse 6, he says, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. So he's saying, you already are quickly turning away from what the gospel that I brought to you that was going to lead you to Christ. You're now agreeing with these people teaching you must be circumcised. So he's frustrated. He, he feels like they're abandoning Paul and everything that he just spent many years preaching and teaching to them. So he doesn't feel like he has anything to be thankful for. And then this is the area where it's a clue to me in this verse that it was they're so quickly turning away from Paul's teaching. This likely was a short time after he had visited them on his first missionary trip. And then he will return to Galatia as soon as the council is over to go on his second trip to them.
to kind of reinforce what he's teaching. Now in verse 11, we'll skip to verse 11, Paul's writing about his conversion. He's almost giving a little mini biography. Because what he's done is in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, he's saying, Paul, an apostle, and he's saying that I have authority from Jesus Christ and from God. I've not, I'm not simply ordained by men. I've been ordained by God to bring you this gospel. And then in verse 11, for the next several verses, he's going to give them his history. Why is he doing this? Because he's trying to show how he has authority and how it is that his message is authentic. Not this message of the people who are preaching circumcision. His message is authentic. And then he also will even tell us toward in that section where he's talking about himself that he went up and met with the apostles, like in verse 18. And then he will even in verse chapter 2, verse 9, he's going to even talk about how he was blessed by the pillars of the apostles, Peter, James, and John. And so he's, going to, he's really stressing the authority he has, that he has been given this mission to preach to them, he's been blessed by the apostles, he's been ordained by God to do this, and that they should listen to him. And then he's, um, let's see, I'm going to read verse 2 real briefly, or verse 9 real briefly, let me see. Yeah, chapter 2, verse 9. And when, they, and when they perceived that grace was given to me, James, Cephas, and Cephas is the Aramaic word for Peter. Peter's name is Cephas in Aramaic, and in just in English it's Peter. So James, Cephas, and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and, then to, and they to the circumcised. And so what he's basically saying is it's them, these Three men who you hold to be the pillars of the apostles had given me the blessing to come preach to you. So again, he's kind of countering these men who are preaching circumcision. So that's chapters 1 and 2, kind of his authority, why it is that his message is authentic, not this other message that they're hearing about circumcision. Then the next thing he's going to start to do is to prove why it is that circumcision is no longer necessary. And he's going to show them that because of Christ, circumcision of the flesh is no longer needed. So if you look down at chapter 3, verse 1, we're going to kind of skip the rest of chapter 2. Chapter 3, verse 1, Paul's going to say, I'm going to read it, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? Let me ask you only this, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law? or by hearing with faith. Are you so foolish? We're going to finish that chapter or that, that passage here in just a second. So first of all, he's saying you're foolish. You're, you're listening to these people who don't have authority to be preaching and teaching. You're listening to what they have to say instead of me. You're going against everything I've just come and taught you. And so um, and he's, being, he's rebuking them and he's being firm with them that he's saying you're foolish for listening. And then he's going to ask them about did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So what does he mean by this section? I'm going to skip my slides ahead, if it will. Let's see. It's kind of slow. All right, well, I don't know what this is doing. So I'll just keep talking while the slides are messing around. Um, so what he's, what he's doing is he's going to remind them of what had happened. So remember Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. This was in Acts chapter 14. Do you remember what had happened in Acts chapter 14 when he was in Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe? I'll give you some hints. This was the, the town where it says he performed signs and wonders. It's the town where he had healed the man who had been paralytic and crippled all his life. And it's the town where they had been called gods. Zeus and Hermes, or Jupiter and Mercury. This is the same community. And so he's saying, did you receive the Spirit? So he's, he's saying the Spirit was evident among you because of all the miracles we were working. You were so amazed and astonished at what was taking place. You even bowed down to Barnabas and myself, calling us gods. You wanted to worship us because you were so amazed. And so he's reminding them of what had happened. They had even called them... Let's see, I'm getting ahead. They even called them Zeus and Hermes. And so he's saying that the Spirit was among you, and you were not circumcised. Not all of them were. There were some Jews in the community, but not all of them had been circumcised. So he's saying, did, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law 
he's meaning by the Mosaic law, by circumcision, or by hearing with faith. It was because of their faith that they were able to perform these miracles among them, is what Paul is suggesting. And so he, he's showing them that they had not been circumcised, yet they received the Spirit. And it was through baptism and faith. So therefore, circumcision is not necessary. And then back to chapter 3, verse 3. Are you so foolish? Having begun with the Spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? And so he's going to say, having begun something spiritual, are you going to end in the flesh? You're going backwards. We have moved on from these law, works of the law. We've moved on from these things that you must do in the flesh, like circumcision. And now we're going in to the, it, we're going to these more spiritual realities, these spiritual truths. So he tells them they're heading in the wrong direction. And then we can see in chapter 3, verse 6, Paul is going to talk about Abraham. And he's going to emphasize to them that Abraham was called by God before being circumcised. And Abraham's going to be an important figure both for the book, uh, letter to the Galatians and to the letter to the Romans. It's important to keep Abraham in mind because Paul is really going to emphasize his story in both letters. But Paul is going to discuss Abraham, and he's going to ask them, when was Abraham first called by God and first declared righteous? And righteous is this sense of being, being just before God, being pleasing before God. And was it when he was circumcised or uncircumcised? The first time in the Old Testament that we're told Abraham was declared righteous was in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, and it was before he was circumcised. Because Abraham's story is that he was living as a pagan in the town of Ur, and then God calls him. And God wants Abraham to take his family and leave. And he wants him to take Sarah and go to the promised land, the land of Cana. And so God says, pick up everything, move, and leave. Abraham has faith in God and the one true God. He abandons his pagan gods and his pagan roots, and he follows the one true God, and he takes Sarah, and they go to the promised land. And so Abraham, out of faith and obedience, is then declared righteous for, what, for obeying God and being faithful. Circumcision doesn't happen with Abraham until Genesis chapter 17, so two chapters later. It's much later in Abraham's life when he's circumcised. Abraham, is made in a, Abraham makes a covenant with God in Genesis chapter 15 when he first obeys and is faithful. That's when the covenant begins. What will later happen is Abraham is going to be disobedient and unfaithful, so God will have to renew the covenant many years later in Abraham's life, and that's when circumcision is, becomes required. So it's later in life. And so what Paul is telling them, so if we look at chapter 3, verse 6, Thus Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So you see that it is men of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Because the Jewish people really held, we are, Abraham's our father, Father Abraham. You hear that word a lot among the Jewish people. He's our father. Well, Paul is showing them, Abraham's the father of everyone who has faith. It's not circumcision that makes you a son of Abraham. It's faith in the one true God. And so he's showing the Jewish people, it's not circumcision that ties you to this covenant. It is to a point, but what God had ultimately intended, this covenant with Abraham, had nothing to do with circumcision. And so because Abraham was able to be declared righteous by faith, this is what God is now calling all people to, both Jew and Gentile. It's no longer the Mosaic law that requires you to have circumcision. It's going to be a greater covenant, this new covenant. And it's going to be more like the covenant with Abraham, where it's your faith, not circumcision, that's key. And so Paul's going to tell them all men of faith are sons of Abraham. Both Jews and Gentiles are welcome into this new covenant. And he's, he's, he's going to remind them, and if you, this chapter in Romans, it's going to be important to understand too, whenever God required circumcision of Abraham, what had happened? God had promised Abraham and Sarah a son. And they wait many, 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 many years, and nothing happens. And so what do they do? They take things into their own hands. They say, well, he had promised us a son, but it hasn't happened yet. So here, Abraham, take our slave, our maidservant, Hagar and have relations with her, and he does, and they have a son. That was not God's plan. God had planned to give them the promised child through Sarah. So God is not happy. Now in the Old Testament, you don't necessarily see the words, God was not happy. But what happens? After Abraham takes Hagar, they have Ishmael, there's silence. God does not talk to Abraham for 13 years. And then finally God talks to him again, and he basically tells him, 
I have pro I'm promising you many descendants. And so in a sense he's saying, what you have done was not my plan. I have promised this covenant to you. I'm faithful to this covenant. I need you to be faithful. And so he renews the covenant with Abraham. And then he requires Abraham and all the men to be circumcised at that point. So circumcision then becomes a sign of the covenant. But it's not how God had intended it from the beginning. It's because of Abraham's disobedience and unfaithfulness. And so circumcision is a, renew a sign of renewal of the covenant. It also is a reminder to Abraham of what he had done, in a sense. This sin of the flesh the circumcision. Um, and so it's a reminder of Abraham what he had done and it's a renewal of the covenant. So it became important, but it wasn't what God had intended. If Abraham had remained faithful, he was going to give him a child. And then ultimately they renew the covenant and then soon after that Isaac will be born and he's the son of the promise. He's the son of Abraham and Sarah. So it had not been God's will what Abraham had decided to do on his own. And that, that's kind of common with our own life. If we kind of get impatient and start to work things out on our own without God, it's going to be a little disastrous oftentimes. And so that's what happens. Um, Abraham causes more trouble than he needed to. Um, God will still be faithful and, and he'll protect Hagar and Ishmael, but that causes problems among the family. Because what will end up happening is Hagar and Sarah have these tensions. Ishmael and Isaac have these tensions. They're all fighting with each other. And ultimately, Abraham throws Hagar and Ishmael out and says, you need to go. And so they'll go to Egypt. But now returning back to Paul here. But it's important to keep that story of Abraham in mind. It'll come back in Romans. But it's also very important because Paul focuses on this to show them it's faith. The new covenant, the foundation is faith. And we'll talk more about what that means as we go along. So returning to Paul, he's using Abraham to show that all men of faith are descendants of Abraham. And it was this faith of Abraham, Abraham to leave home, to leave everything, and be obedient and faithful to God. And it was this deep faith where Abraham entered the covenant with God. This has all happened before he was circumcised. So circumcision is no longer necessary, is what Paul's trying to emphasize through this story and reminder about Abraham. God has called all people, Jew and Gentile, into this new covenant that now exists because of Christ. So then if we go to chapter 3, verse 11, what Paul's going to do, he's shown, Paul doesn't have to write too much because these Jewish people know their faith inside and out. All he has to do is say, Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness, so you see it's men of faith who are the sons of Abraham. They don't have to have any other explanation. The people know what Paul is getting at. Um, and so Paul won't have to say too much, but he brings to mind Abraham and Abraham's story. And then he immediately says after that in verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 11, Now it is evident that no man is justified before God by the law. He's talking about the Mosaic law. For, and he quotes an Old Testament passage, He who through faith is righteous shall live. And this is Habakkuk. Two, chapter 2, verse 4. Let's see these slides are behind. But Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4. What Paul is doing is he's quoting the Old Testament. Why? He's showing them that there's continuity. I'm not inventing this idea that we don't need circumcision, we only need faith. It's there, it's in the prophets. Habakkuk was a prophet. He already had foreshown that this was going to be the way God had intended reality to be. So he's showing that it's faith and not the works of the law that saves us. So this is not a new teaching, it's a fulfillment of what God had prepared for us in the Old Testament. So he wants to emphasize to them, I'm not inventing this teaching. So he quotes Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4, and he'll quote this again in Romans, that it's faith, not the Mosaic law. Now one of the things we also have to point out, because if you look at um, chapter, chapter 3 verse 10, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. And he says, For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. And so what Paul is talking about, this works of the law that we've already mentioned a few times, it's the Mosaic law. And let me skip to that. I have a slide on that. So works of the law. This is key for Paul. Very, very key. Because it's different for James, but for Paul, when he's talking about works of the law, both in Galatians and Romans and in his letters, he's talking about the Mosaic Law, the laws that we find in the Torah, which are the first five books of the Old Testament. And so you find this in Deuteronomy and Leviticus specifically. Those are the books of the law. They tell all the Jewish people here is everything you need to do. And so it tells them this is how you keep the covenant. 
with the works of the law. And so Paul will use several phrases. He'll say works of the law, or he'll say the law. He may say works. He may call it the the Mosaic law or the law of Moses. All those phrases referring to the same thing. And so these works of the law, they include circumcision. They include the kosher law, what to eat and not eat. They include the what to do on a Sabbath. There are many very strict rules about what could and couldn't be done on the Sabbath, like you can't walk more than a mile or, or you can't do any type of work, and it'll define what that means. And so all these things were necessary to be obeyed in order to stay in covenant with God. And so to the Jewish people, the works of the law were what was required to remain in covenant. And there were hundreds of these, and so you, you can find them in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, and they're required to be faithful. And so anytime we see this phrase, we have to keep that in mind what Paul is talking about. Because he's not necessarily saying, today we may say works that are required or faith and works. This is totally different terminology that Paul's using. He's talking about the Mosaic Law specifically. And what Paul is also reminding them is that with this covenant comes a promise and a curse. So just read verse 10. It's talking about there's a curse for those who do not keep the law. Because what God had told them with the Mosaic Law, with the Mosaic Covenant, was, I'm going to be faithful, and I ask for your faithfulness and obedience in return. If you keep the covenant, the blessing is you'll be a part of God's covenant family. If you break the law, then the punishment is death. There will be punishment, and the ultimate punishment is death of breaking the law, breaking this covenant. And so Paul is going to show them in verse 10, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by what's in the law. Cursed. There's a punishment. And ultimately, the Old Testament tells tells us, and Paul will tell us later, this punishment is death. So Paul is going to show them there's a blessing and a curse. And so he tells them that those who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. So if the Jewish people are going to continue to emphasize we must still be obedient to the Mosaic law, then he tells them, well, if you're, going to re- if you're going to demand this, then you're under a curse. Why? Because Israel as a whole has been unfaithful. They have n- not been obedient to the Mosaic law. Now, Paul is making a generalization because as <clears throat> we talked about last, last time, Paul says, I'm blameless in the, as a Pharisee. I'm a blameless Pharisee in the eyes of the Torah. So there are some individual people who could be faithful and keep the covenant and keep the laws, but the majority could not. So he's saying a generalization. In general, Israel, all of us as a whole, have not been faithful. We've been disobedient to this covenant. And so if we continue to rely on the Mosaic covenant and this and these laws that go along with it, then we deserve to be punished because we're not being faithful and obedient. So he says that the Mosaic law does not justify anyone because we've all been disobedient. We need something else. And he says that the law is not something, the other problem with the Mosaic law is it doesn't have any power to make us justified before God. Even if you keep the law, you're in covenant, but it doesn't have any power to help you keep the law, doesn't have, have any power um, to make you pleasing. And so Paul's going to show us later that, that God has a solution for all of this. And so Paul's going to remind them that we were called to be lights to the world, but we failed. And he'll bring this up in Romans again. We've called to be lights to the world. We've called to bring all people into covenant, and we haven't. We've turned inward on ourselves. We've become more worried about ourselves and more worried about appearances. If you remember that passage where Jesus kind of rebukes the Pharisees for keeping the outside parts of the dishes clean, but the inside's still dirty. They're relying on these externals. They're not interiorly transformed. He's going to remind them that we've been unfaithful. And because of our unfaithfulness, we deserve punishment. We deserve death, which is the curse of the law. And so in chapter 3, verse 14, 13 and 14, it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. So God's solution is that Christ came and redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who hangs on a tree. So Paul is saying, because he came and was crucified, he took on this curse for all of us. He stood in the place of Israel and took on the death we deserve for breaking the covenant. In verse 14, that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So this gets a little confusing because now he's jumping to the Abraham covenant. So what we have to recognize, there's multiple covenants. 
There's the Mosaic Law and the Mosaic Covenant. This is the one given through Moses to the, between God and Israel. And this has happened on Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments and then all the other laws would come afterwards when they were unfaithful. And so if you're obedient to the law, the blessing is that you remain in covenant family with God. If you're disobedient, you're punished and you deserve death. You deserve to be cursed. Then there's also a covenant with Abraham. God had told Abraham through his covenant that he was going to promise him blessings. He promised Abraham land, a kingdom, and worldwide blessing. We're going to come back to this. There's also another covenant, the covenant with Adam. We're all under this covenant as well. Now with the Abraham covenant, there really wasn't a curse. It was just a blessing. Um, the covenant with Adam, there was a curse and a blessing. If you're obedient, you're going to be filled with grace. You'll have immortality. You'll have eternal communion with God, harmony with everything, harmony with God and with each other, dominion over the animals. If you're disobedient, death, and this is what ended up happening, as we all know, death and pain and suffering and corruption, having to toil and labor, um, labor pains, loss of communion with God, and ultimately loss of grace. And this loss of grace from our soul that is passed down to all of us is original sin. So being born without grace is this born without original sin. And all that's a consequence of Adam and the covenant that he, Adam and Eve broke that they had with God. So we have to keep these covenants in mind because Paul will kind of jump around a little bit because he knows the people he's writing to know these things. It's just second nature for them to, knowing their history. And so Paul is going to talk about the Mosaic Law. We no longer are under that in this new covenant. But the problem with Mosaic Law is that we, as a whole, Israel has been unfaithful. So we deserve death. We deserve to be cursed. But the good news is Christ came and took on that punishment for us. We deserve this punishment. Christ came and took it on for us. And then he's going to skip the rest. Next, next part, chapter 13, he starts talking about this covenant with Abraham. Because he says in verse 14 again, that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles and that we, we all, might receive the promise of the Spirit. So what does that mean? So Paul is saying that not only does Christ come and take on the punishment for Israel with the Mosaic Covenant, he's also going to bring the blessing that had been promised to Abraham. I know it's a little confusing. It'll, hopefully it'll make sense with these next few verses that, he, that Paul's going to talk about. So he's going to talk about, in verse 15, and following this whole section, he's going to show them that the Mosaic Covenant and the Covenant with Abraham both exist. One didn't wipe out the other. It wasn't nullified. Just because Abraham had the Covenant first and then the Mosaic Covenant was next, it didn't nullify the first one. They both still exist. Okay, so he's going to show them they both still exist. And he says that no one nullifies something once it has been ratified. So that in verse 15. That's kind of a confusing phrase. But what he's going to compare this to is marriage. And he's going to compare this in this in the letter to the Galatians and in Romans. Say so just like you have a husband and wife. When they get married they have this covenant. This covenant is binding for the rest of their life. If one spouse dies, the covenant covenant then becomes unbinding. The husband or the wife is no longer bound to the spouse after they die. But as long as both spouses are alive, the covenant is still binding. And so he's going to show them that um, with Abraham and, and with Abraham's covenant and with the Mosaic covenant, Israel still existed, Abraham's descendants still existed, God still existed. Really, you didn't have any party of these covenants that had died, and so neither one nullified the other. He's going to make this more clear in the letter to the Romans. But he says these are two separate covenants, God with Israel and God with Abraham and Abraham's descendant. So these are separate covenants and they don't nullify each other. They don't wipe each other out or cross each other off. They both still exist. And so he's going to point out that with, in verse, this is an interesting passage because in chapter 3, verse 16, he's going to tell them that the covenant with Abraham, he's going to kind of almost interpret for us something that happened in the Old Testament. He says the covenant Abraham in verse 16, I'll read it. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. And Paul tells us, it does not say and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, singular. 
which is Christ. So what Paul is emphasizing is that you have a covenant that God made with Israel and a covenant that God made with Abraham and a singular descendant. Not to the whole world, not to every descendant, to one singular descendant, and this descendant was Christ. So because none of those parties had been had died, you, couldn't, you can't have one covenant nullifying the other. And so he's going to tell them both these covenants still exist. And then we want to look at the blessing, the covenant with Abraham real quick. God had promised land. That was fulfilled. When did Abraham and his descendants get the promised land of Cana? They finally got it once Joshua entered and he crossed um, the Jordan River and he, con- he went into the, to the land of Cana and started conquering those territories. Ultimately, they will take the entire land of Cana with David when they finally take Jerusalem. But it begins with Joshua that this taking of the land starts to take place. So God had promised land. That's fulfilled with Joshua and then David. And then God had promised a kingdom. That's fulfilled with David. Once David becomes king, Israel now has a kingdom. Uh, Abraham and his descendants have a kingdom. And then God had promised worldwide blessing. But that had never happened yet. There was no, nothing that had come into existence with worldwide blessing until Christ. And what Paul is pointing out is that Christ's death on the cross now made this worldwide blessing available to all. And he's showing this worldwide blessing is grace, the Holy Spirit. Until Christ, this worldwide blessing, that part of the promise had not yet been fulfilled. But Christ comes and fulfills it. And that's why he says in verse 16 that this promise, this covenantal promise was made to Abraham and then a singular offspring who would ultimately come to fulfill everything that God had promised Abraham. And we can also see that even in Christ, these other things are fulfilled even higher. So the land, the promised land in Cana, well, Christ now also even gives us something greater, a promised land in heaven with the kingdom. It was fulfilled in David, an earthly kingdom, but there's also something greater. There's now this new kingdom with Christ, um, God's kingdom that is now, and, and it, we're told that Christ is the king of kings. He is the eternal king. And then this worldwide blessing. So Paul is showing them that now the covenant with Abraham has been completely fulfilled and these blessings have come into effect through Christ. Now grace is available to all and all can now be finally full members of, the, of, of God's new covenant with Christ. And so it gets a little confusing because Paul's wanting to show them many different things in one short letter. He's going to show them we still have the Mosaic Law at that point before Christ. We still have the Abraham Covenant and, and the Mosaic Covenant before Christ. And now Christ has come to fulfill the covenant with Abraham and now he has come to make the Mosaic law, the Mosaic covenant no longer necessary because he died. Now one spouse of that covenant, Christ stood in for Israel, now that spouse has died, that covenant is no longer valid, it's void. And Christ came in because Israel had been unfaithful and deserved punishment, Christ came and took on that punishment for the whole Israel. All right, and then if we go to chapter 3, verse 18, Paul is going to say, For if the inheritance is by the law, it is no longer by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Again, very confusing. But what he's showing us is that children, God calls all of us to be children, both Jew and Gentile. This idea of inheritance is going to go to God's children. We're all called to be God's children. So if we're united to Christ, we then can receive this worldwide blessing, this grace, this promise, this inheritance that Christ promises to give to his children, but you only can receive that through Christ and being united to him. And Paul is then going to show us um, here shortly that it's going to be baptism. And he's going to show us in Romans 6 and here in Galatians that it's baptism that unites us to Christ. We become children and unite ourselves to Christ through baptism. And so we're going to skip down to verse 23 um, so we can see this section. So Paul will tell them we must now be baptized to be united to Christ. And he's going to tell them, if we look through t- verse 26, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as, many as you, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. 
There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are heirs, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So he's going to show them that it's through baptism we can be united to Christ. Through baptism, we become adopted sons of God. Through baptism, we receive this inheritance, which is this grace, this worldwide blessing that Christ came and won on the cross. Mosaic law is no longer, it's void, it's no longer necessary. Now we just need to simply be united to Christ to receive this inheritance, this gift of grace. Okay. All right, um, let's see. What time do y'all have? 715. 715? Okay. All right, well, let's stop for a second. Do y'all have questions about this? I know it's a little confusing because Paul is very, very deep. He's jumping around about these covenants. But he's, he's basically trying to prove to them that we don't need to be circumcised. That's what this letter, the key point, is we don't need to be circumcised. There's so many divisions. We don't need to be circumcised. But he has to prove it to them. You can imagine, this has been around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. The Jewish people needed to be circumcised. They needed to keep the kosher laws. They needed to keep the Mosaic law. They needed to keep these things. And so Paul is now having to show them that this is no longer necessary. It's going to take some time to convince these Jewish Christians this is no longer necessary because it's been a part of their culture and a part of their faith for so long. Okay, so he's talking about these covenants and he uses only a few phrases and a few words to really go into this much depth. He's really into chapter 3, and, he, and he's already spent this much time showing them these things, um, th- these really deep kind of understandings of what it means, what these covenants mean. Okay? Do y'all have questions? Confusing? Confused? Makes sense, hopefully. Um, because what he's going to do then in chapter 4, and I won't spend too much time on this, but he's going to compare Hagar and Sarah as the covenants. And so he's going to say, Hagar, remember Hagar? She was the maidservant, the slave, and Ishmael was her son, and then Sarah and Isaac. He's going to say, Hagar and Ishmael were slaves. Sarah and Isaac were the promised. Isaac was the promised, the son of the promise. Ishmael was the son of the slave. He's going to say, these are like the two covenants, the Mosaic covenant and the new covenant. And what's the Mosaic Covenant do? If you continue to emphasize that you have to keep this, what is it going to do? It's going to produce children uh, that are slaves. You're enslaved to this old way of thinking, this old way of living. You're going backwards. But if you're faithful to this new covenant that Christ brings, it's now possible to become sons of the promise, this promise of grace, this promise of this inheritance that God has always intended from the beginning. Um, but now is making fulfilled and possible through Christ. He's going to show them Hagar and Sarah. These are like covenants. We want to be like Sarah and Isaac. And then he's going to say, what did Sarah do to the slave woman and her son when they started to cause tensions? What did, what did they do in the Old Testament that I mentioned? Whenever Hagar and Sarah are having kind of disputes and Ishmael and Isaac are fighting, what do they do? They kick Hagar and Ishmael out, right? So Paul's going to say, just like in the Old Testament, whenever they got rid of the slave, the Hagar and her son, the slaves, whenever they got rid of them for calling, causing tension, I want you to do the same. Get rid of this teaching from the, the, circumcision, the circumcision party. Ignore it. Don't live it. Don't listen to it. Otherwise, you're going backwards. You're, bec- you're going from being sons of freedom to sons that are, that are slaves. You're enslaving yourself in this old way of thinking. So you're going to use the, that kind of analogy in chapter 4 to just emphasize to them, you do not need to follow the Mosaic Law. You do not need to listen to these people who are teaching that you must be circumcised. He's actually going to be pretty harsh in chapter 5 about this. You see in chapter 5, verse 1, keep this same analogy in mind because he was just talking about it. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand fast, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. He's saying this Mosaic law simply enslaves you. It sh- the law, he's going to show us later, the law is not bad. It's showing you how God calls you to live, but there's, it's, in, it's almost impossible to be faithful to it. 
So it's only going to enslave you further if you continue to live by it because you're not going to be faithful and you don't have access to grace. The Mosaic law, the Mosaic covenant does not offer you grace. So you're not, you're not going to be free if you continue to be bound to that. And then in verse 2, Now I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. He's saying, so if you continue to hold that the circumcision is necessary, Christ can't be an advantage because you won't receive grace through that. This, this grace Christ won, it won't be an advantage to you if you're circumcised. And then he's going to tell them in verse 4, You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. And literally, um, he is kind of, let's see, where is he? Literally, if you think of this idea of severed, he's kind of referring to circumcision. What does circumcision do? It cuts on the flesh. So he's kind of, he's going to have a play on words in several places here. Um, So he's going to say that, um, in a minute he's going to say, you're severed from Christ. In a minute he's going to say, who has hindered you, is often the, our translation, um, in verse 7. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Literally, it doesn't really say hindered. It says, who cut on you? And so he's having this play on words, um, this idea of being cut and being severed. In a minute, he's going to refer to these people who are coming in, in verse 12, who, um, this idea of castration. I wish those with you would mutilate themselves. I mean, he's being very harsh, but because he's trying to make a point. So he's trying to tell them, this circumcision of the flesh, where you're cut on, where things are severed, you're going in the wrong direction. You don't need to do that anymore. So he's going to rebuke them pretty harshly and say, don't listen to this. So we're going to jump to chapter 6 now, because that's basically what chapter 5, the first part anyways, is talking about. So the last part, of actually we'll pa- part, talk about a little part of chapter 5 and chapter 6. Because this is when, where I really feel like Paul gets to the heart of this, of what he's trying to show them. He's going to kind of sum it up and be very, making a very important point. Because he's led to this point of proving they don't need to be circumcised. And now he's going to show them. So let's start with chapter 5, verse 13. And remember what all he said to this point. He's going to say, For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love be servants of one another. So he's calling them to freedom, this freedom through Christ. But don't take advantage of this. It doesn't mean you can live how you want, is what he's going to tell them. So in verse 14, let's, we're going to come back to verse 14, but we can read it now. But it says, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And we're going to skip to verse 16. He says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you would. This is going to tell them, you are now called to freedom in Christ. You are called to grace. But it doesn't mean live however you want. It doesn't mean do whatever you want to do. It doesn't mean whenever you, your flesh has these various desires and passions that you give in to them. No, you must walk in the Spirit. He's going to show them what that means. And so if you start with verse 18, he's going to show them what it means to be led by the Spirit. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the law, now the law works of the flesh are plain. Immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness. We'll keep going, keep going. And then I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So it's not faith alone. It's faith plus grace and walking and living in the Spirit. You must, obi- must let this Spirit work within you and not give in to the pleasures of the flesh. And he's going to show them what, it, what the fruit of the Spirit is. So a sign that you're faithful to the covenant and living in this new covenant, that you're faithful to the new covenant, that you're walking by the Spirit, is that you'll have love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and faithfulness. And he'll continue on with several signs that, you're, that you are living in this new covenant walking in the Spirit. And so then he's going to point out to them, chapter 6, verse 2. So he's going to show them, you're called to freedom, but it doesn't mean live however you want. You need to walk by the Spirit. There are certain things that if you continue to do these things, you will not inherit the kingdom. You will lose your inheritance of grace. And then he comes in chapter 6, verse 2, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Christ. 
This to me is a really key phrase, the law of Christ. He's showing them that this new covenant has a law also. The Mosaic law is no longer necessary, but there is still a law. This new covenant comes with a law. And he's going to emphasize this in Romans too. But here he calls it the law of Christ. In other places he'll call it the law of faith, or the law of grace, or the law of love, but the law of Christ. And so then he will say, there is no confusion. There is still a law in this new covenant. It's just not the law of Moses. It's not the Mosaic law. It's the law of Christ. And if you jump back to chapter 5, verse 14, how do we fulfill this law of Christ? It says the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And it shows in other places that this law of Christ is love. This law of the new covenant that you must abide by is love. And he's going to emphasize that in Romans, but um, there is still a law in this new covenant. So faith, faith is, is in very key, but faith doesn't just mean an assent. Oh yes, I believe in Jesus, and that's all. It, it, I just need to say those words, and I'm a part of this covenant. No, you need to number one be united to Christ through baptism. Once you're united to Christ and receive this grace, you must walk by the Spirit. You must continue to have faith, be obedient, and then be faithful to this law of love, this law of Christ. And so he's going to tell them, you are now free from the Mosaic law, but you're not free from all law. There's still a law you must follow. And so he's going to really pretty much end it there. At the end of next part of chapter 6, um, verse 8, he's going to tell them, start with verse 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. For he who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary in well-doing. Do not lose heart. So he encourages them, you must live by the Spirit. Because God will judge you based on how you live your life and how faithful you are to this new covenant and how, how much you cooperate with His grace. This grace, what He'll tell us later in Romans, is it enables you to live this law. And that's how this new covenant is better and greater than the old covenant. Because grace makes it possible for us to be faithful. Um, but it is important that we are faithful. So Galatians is just this short little introduction. We don't need the Mosaic Law. You don't need to be circumcised. You need to enter into this new covenant with Christ through baptism and then have faith and then be faithful to this law of Christ, this law of love, because you will reap what you sow. And he says, don't lose heart. Continue to be faithful. And then he'll finish up that letter. Um, and then the, the, in, this chapter, in the final part of chapter 6, he gives a little summary of what he's talked about. The circumcision is not necessary. And then he will tell them in um, verse 16, because he's just said in verse 15, for neither, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Peace and mercy be upon all who walk by this rule. So everything he's just told them. And then he's telling them, a peace and mercy upon the Israel of God. And to me, this is another key phrase. Because what he's showing them is, Christians, you are now the new Israel. You're the new Israel of God. I'm not abandoning my old faith. I'm not aban abandoning my Jewish life. But now it's been fulfilled in Christ. We are now the new Israel of God. All Christians, both Jew and Gentile, are called to be a part of God's family, this new Israel. And this new family does have a great inheritance through grace, and this inheritance is the glory that you can receive in heaven, but you must also follow the laws of this family, um, this law of this new covenant, which is the law of Christ. And so he's going to just kind of remind them of that throughout this letter. Okay, we're going to stop there. We'll take like a five-minute break, and then we'll come back and um, jump into Romans for the last part of this class for tonight. All right, well, we'll get started um, with Romans. Romans is a little more challenging. Um, hopefully, I think I hopefully fixed this slide thing, the slide situation. Um, we only have an hour, so I'm probably not going to get through the entire book because it's very, very deep. Um, this is Paul's longest writing, his longest letter. If you look at the way they're generally organized, it's from the longest to the shortest. And so Romans is first, not because of time, because it's the longest. Um, so it's very, very deep theologically. 
Um, it's unfortunately also where there's a lot of confusion. So a lot of the um, Protestant interpretations of doctrine come because they're using Romans and often they're kind of misinterpreting what Paul's teaching. Martin Luther significantly took Romans and misinterpreted some things to start to teach that Paul taught faith alone. Um, and so we'll see where Luther kind of saw that and we'll see why it is he misunderstood because Paul is very confusing. Um, but Martin Luther did take chapter 3 from this and think Paul, God, that Paul and God through him was showing us faith alone. And so he kind of, that led him to do a lot of what Martin Luther did. So what we'll start with is the context. So this was probably written around 55 to 57 AD, probably. Um, this was before Paul was arrested because he tells them, I have yet to visit you. Um, so he's waiting to visit the Romans at some point. But these are the Christians who are living in Rome, the capital of the empire. So that'll be an important context to think, to re recall. Um, and so Paul will, to write to both Jewish Christians and Roman uh, Gentile Christians who are living together in Rome. And one of the key things he's going to address throughout the letter is the tension. In Rome, just like in Galatia, although in, in Rome he's not completely addressing this circumcision party, these people teaching circumcision, he's not completely addressing them um, because it's not so much that group that's a problem, it's just the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians themselves living amongst, amongst each other are having tensions and they're having disagreements over what is and isn't necessary because the Jewish Christians are largely still holding to a lot of the things they have been used to. They are still holding to some of the kosher laws. Um, they are still holding to some of the feast days and, and some of the practices that they had. And so they're starting to argue as to whether or not these things are necessary. And communication today is nothing like it was back then. And so these, the messages of what's happening in Galatia and Jerusalem aren't necessarily traveling quickly. Um, and so they're, they're having these same divisions that we see a little bit of in Galatia um, that Paul just wrote about. Um, but they're having these same issues. There's this issue with unity and dissension and division fighting over this. And we can see this throughout the letter, particularly in chapter 14. I'm not going to skip to it right now. Paul will tell us in chapter 14. You're arguing over about what feast days to keep and what kosher laws and, and what practices to do. This division is disruptive to the church. It's disruptive to charity and to love. The key of this letter, the underlying key, is unity. That division um, disrupts charity. And that we have to build up the community. We can't fight over things that are not really essential. Um, and, and one of the things that's key is meat. Okay, So there becomes a problem with meat. Um, and he'll address this in various places in this letter. In a community with a pagan temple, what would often happen is they would take the meat, or they would take an animal, sacrifice it in the pagan temple, and kill it offer it to their God, and any meat that was left over, they had a little market, and they would sell the meat in the market. So they fight over whether or not it was okay to buy this meat. Well, the Jewish people had these kosher laws, and a lot of them were like, no, we're not going to eat this meat, it's not kosher. Um, and then some of the other Christians, particularly the Gentile Christians, but some of the other, maybe even some of the Jews possibly, but they were saying, well, this meat doesn't mean anything. We don't believe in these gods. This meat doesn't have any power in it. Big deal. It's meat. It's, let's buy it, let's eat it, it's meat, it's available. Um, we don't believe in anything that had happened to make the meat produced. And so they'll fight over whether or not they can eat the meat. And so Paul will ultimately tell them, it doesn't matter. You can eat the meat if you want, don't eat the meat if you don't want. Whatever makes you feel like you're being faithful to your conscience and to what God's calling you to do. But at the same time, and even more importantly, respect your brothers and sisters. Because if what you do is bringing scandal to someone else, then don't do it. So if you may be eating a meal with a Jewish person, a Jewish Christian who is really opposed to this idea of eating meat from the marketplace, then don't eat it. If it's going to cause tension and division, this is a little thing to argue about. Don't cause tension. Build up love. Build up the community. He's going to tell the, both the groups, it's okay to abstain from the meat. It's okay to eat it. But the more important thing is your brother in the community. Let's not cause divisions and fight over things that aren't essential. So he's going to make those points in several places in this letter. And so you have to understand that's a key thing that he's going to teach throughout the letter is this division between the Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians. And so that's going to be a key thing. And he's also going to talk about unity, charity, division. And then he's going to talk about what it is that God did for all of us 
so that both Jew and Gentile are now part of this covenant, just like he did with Galatia, the Galatians. Talking about Jew and Gentile are both now called to be in this covenant with God. So we're going to start at the just the very beginning of this, these first few chapters. Um, I'm going to skip to this section. Um, yeah, and this is one thing, like this last line up here. Paul's going to, in my own paraphrase of him, he's going to basically say, we can't just say let's all get along to get along. We, we don't want to make others stum- stumble and fall. Scandal is a problem. Don't cause scandal. And if it's over something as insignificant as whether or not you eat meat, then let's not fight over it. Now, he's not saying do whatever, do whatever you want. He's not saying we can be kind of cafeteria Catholics and go pick what teachings we want and follow only those. No. He's ta- not talking about doctrinal issues. He's talking about disciplinary things and simple day-to-day things that have nothing to do with God's revelation and God's teachings. He's just saying when it's simple things like whether or not you can eat a piece of meat offered in a pagan temple, all meat is clean, it's fine, but if the other person has a problem with it, don't do it. All right, and so the other thing, as I mentioned, remember, Rome is the capital of the empire. Caesar lives here. This is his home. He's going to travel throughout the empire, but he lives here. And since the time of Augustus, Caesar Augustus, um, he was the, uh, basically he had kind of succeeded Julius, Julius Caesar. He was, the, Augustus was the next emperor. And since Augustus, the Caesar, the emperor, had been given titles. They were called, and we talked about this the other night, son of God, savior of the world, bringer of peace, king and lord. And then Caesar was to be worshipped along with the other pagan gods. These are all key things because it, it, to do, to call anyone else other than Caesar these things, it was illegal. There was also a gospel that had been written about the life of Caesar. It was called the Gospel of Caesar Augustus because gospel just means um, good news, evangelium, good news. So Augustus Caesar had a gospel written about his own life showing the good news is I'm the Savior, I'm the bringer of peace, and it talked about all the good things Caesar Augustus had done. So when we see our own apostles and disciples writing gospels, they are, be, they are basically attacking this truth because this gospel existed before like Luke's gospel. So Luke, you know, he's going to write his gospel. He's, Luke is really powerful in his gospel about how he's attacking some of these things of the culture. Um, but they're basically saying, this is a false gospel. The true gospel is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so in Paul's letter to the Romans, the capital of the empire, he's going to attack these titles of Caesar right off. He's going to talk about in the very first verse that he is, he, that St. Paul was set aside for the gospel of God. So he's going to show them there is one gospel, the gospel of God. Not this, these other gospels you're hearing about, about the Caesar, about Caesar Augustus and the other Caesars. He's also going to talk about the Son of God and the Lord and the King. So throughout this letter, he's going to basically be attacking these titles of Caesar. So he's being very countercultural. He's attacking the truth the pagan world holds to. He's doing something illegal, but he's doing it because it's the truth. So he's coming to show them um, the truth. And so in Romans chapter 1, right away, we're going to see these phrases, Son of God. Jesus Christ, our Lord, I thank, I thank my, I thank my God and the gospel of God. So he's going to start off in verse one. He's going to say, "Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ." Really, what that says is "doulos," which means slave. So right away, he's going to call himself a slave of Christ. That's going to be a key phrase. And the other thing in chapter 1 that's key, so he's a slave of Christ. That's going to come back in a little while, uh, but he's a slave. So he's going to call them to be slaves of Christ as well. And then what Paul's going to do is something that's called an inclusio. And we're going to see this in, in many writings, St. Paul, but even the Gospels do this. And the inclusio is basically, you can think of like bookends or brackets. It's going to be a phrase or a term or a passage that's going to be at the beginning and the end of an important statement. So sometimes you may see it in an entire letter. You'll have the inclusio at the beginning and inclusio at the end. Other times, like in some of the Gospels, it'll be in certain sections. You'll have these key themes that are repeated. So there's a bracket. The bracket's the key theme. He'll write a whole lot. And then the bracket again to show, here's my key theme and here's how I'm giving you evidence for it. So Paul does this. In Romans chapter 1, verse 5, he's going to tell us that I come to bring... Uh, bring about the obedience of faith. This is going to be the, the inclusio because in chapter 16, verse 25 to 26, when he ends this letter, he's going to say, may God bring about within them an obedience of faith. So he's going to show us right off 
that his key thing for this letter is an obedience of faith. That's his key phrase. So it's called an inclusio. And so you can look for those when you're reading Paul's letters and the Gospels. Look for these key phrases that are kind of repeated at the beginning and the end because they're going to show you something that the author finds to be of the utmost importance of what they're writing and why they're writing it. So right away we can see this idea of Martin Luther faith alone is wrong because that's not Paul's message at all. He's not preaching faith alone. He's preaching an obedience of faith. And he'll talk more about what that means throughout the letter. So Paul in chapter 1 is going to say he comes to bring about, he's a slave of Christ, set apart for the gospel. So his mission is going to be to spread the gospel. And the, pur- the purpose is to bring about an obedience of faith. And then we jump down to verse 16. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Letting the Christians know right off, this is the one true gospel, and I'm not ashamed to preach it. It may be illegal to, to preach a gospel of somebody else, but I'm not ashamed because it's the truth. And then he says, The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. The Jew first and also the Greek. And then verse 17, For, it, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. And so he's going to talk about that faith is this doorway to salvation. He's going to, in verse 17, he again he quotes Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. He did this in Galatians as well. Because he's showing, I'm not inventing this, this is in the Old Testament as well, now we're fulfilling it, that he who through faith is righteous shall live. So he's saying faith is a very key foundation for what we're going to, what the gospel message is. Faith is key. And that those who believe in the gospel, the gospel is the power of God. And it, it, can, it brings salvation to all, both Jew and Gentile. And again, he doesn't mean faith alone, but we don't really know that yet. Other than he said obedience of faith. So he's going to remind them of that phrase, and he's going to explain what he means with faith in a minute. What Paul does in this letter is he sets it up. It's not just random. Um, he has themes, and he breaks it up. The first section is what we can call kind of the wrath of God. He's going to give them the bad news of reality because he's going to prepare them for the good news. But he's got to show them the bad news so that they can be excited once we hear what the good news is. But the bad news, this is Romans chapter 1 through chapter 3. The rest part from chapter 118 up to chapter 3. So what's the bad news? The bad news is that we all need to be redeemed because we've all sinned. And he's going to say the reality is that sin builds upon sin. He's going to tell them throughout the rest of this chapter 1 and chapter 2 is that sin is this downward spiral. Once you get into it, it's going to continue to get worse and worse and worse. Sin builds upon sin. You fall into deeper and deeper sin. In chapter 1, verse 21, he's going to basically start talking about that all people can know God exists through creation. So no one has an excuse. No one has an excuse. Everyone should know the, the reality of God, the Creator, through His creation. And then he says that because God shows Himself as the Creator, then all have a duty to worship Him. And he's going to use the phrase kind of to give, give Him honor and thanks. That's in verse 21. So all have, he says, for although they knew God, so all, all humanity should, doesn't have an excuse. They can know God through the creation. So for although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give Him thanks. So basically, they did not worship God. So they know Him, but they don't worship Him. So he says if the godless, if you become godless, it's going to lead to this downward spiral. And he's going to say the rest of verse 21. So they don't worship God, and then they become futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. So he's going to talk about how, and you're going to see this repeated again and, and later on in chapter 12, our minds and our hearts are connected. If our lives are not oriented to God, it's going to be a downward spiral. We must be oriented to God so that our thinking can be focused on the truth. And then if our thinking is focused on the truth, our hearts will then also be focused on following the truth. But once we don't worship God, we don't put God first, then our minds are going to turn into futile thinking. We'll follow things other than the truth and then our hearts will be darkened. And it will get worse and worse and worse for us the deeper we get into sin. And so then Paul's going to tell them that the, uh, the punishment for sin that God gives us is He hands us over to more sin. 
He, because of our free will, he lets us choose. And because we have this choice to either love him or reject him, that if we choose to reject him, he's going to respect that decision and not coerce us to love him. So he's kind of going to give in and let us, if we can want to reject him, we'll continue to reject him. He won't stop us. So sin will build upon sin. And so the crime was the refusal to, give, to worship God. And that's evident in their sins. And, he, and Paul tells us they continue to dishonor themselves. And in verse 25... He's going to say they continue to dishonor themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and they worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. So they've turned things upside down. All humanity has has done this. And so for this disobedience, they were enslaved to their own passions. So they committed evil acts. And so he will tell them, let's see, in verse 29, They were filled with all manner of wickedness and evil, covetousness, malice, envy, murder, strife, deceit, gossips, slanderers, haters of God, boastful. Skip down a few more. They're foolish, they're faithless, they're ruthless. And then he says in verse 32, which is a powerful statement, then they not only disobey God, but begin approving of the sins of others, and they will even call good evil and evil good. He shows this is the, the downfall that we have. If we don't keep our minds oriented to truth and, and put God as the center of our lives, it's this downward spiral, and ultimately we'll even approve of things and, and call evil good and good evil. And so that's in basically verse 32. And he's he, he's not saying that the words call evil good and good evil. He's saying they approve... They, he says, not only do they do them, but they approve them, these acts that are unrighteous. Um, and I'm just kind of quoting from an Old Testament uh, passage where it says, calling good evil and evil good. But Paul is basically keeping putting that in mind because he says that they not only do these evil things, they approve of them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then he's going to show us in chapter 2, verse 6. For he will, for God, will render to every man according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give them eternal life. But for those who are, <clears throat> for those who are factious and do not obey the truth but obey wickedness, there will be wrath and fury. And so he's going to show them the consequences of sin. So they, there will be judgment. Glory and honor and eternal life for those who are obedient to the truth and who do good and wrath and fury and tribulation for those who are wicked. So he's still showing them the bad news. And so he's going to tell them, basically in chapters 1 and chapters 2, this first part of chapter 2, he's going to show them that the Gentiles don't have the Mosaic law, but they still have a law. And we see this in verse 13, 12 and 13 that they have the natural law written on their hearts. And if they obey this, then they are obeying God. And so Paul says that they can still be obedient even though they don't have the Mosaic law because they can obey the natural law that God put on our hearts. So they can still recognize God as the creator. They can give him worship and praise and thanks. They can be obedient to the natural law and they will be living rightly and faithfully. And he'll just emphasize, but not worshiping God is going to lead to futile thinking and hearts will be darkened and you'll be judged for disobedience. And then starting with chapter 2, verse 17, he's going to speak to the Jewish people a little more um, intimately. So he's going to have shown them how the Gentiles can be faithful, and now he's going to turn to the Jews and say that you, as Jews, my brethren, not only do you have the natural law, because you still have that law you need to be faithful to, but you also have the Mosaic law, because you're in covenant with God. So now you need to also be faithful to that law. But he's going to show the Jewish people, you have been unfaithful to this law, unfaithful to this covenant. And he's going to show them that you have not lived up to your mission. You teach people and you're guiding people, but you yourself haven't even been faithful. So you're being blind guides. You're being foolish. And he's going to quote, um, in verse 24, he's going to quote the prophet Ezekiel, who says that, For it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Because of the way the Jews have lived and been unfaithful, 
God's name is now blasphemed among the Gentiles. That's not what was supposed to happen. They were, the Jews were supposed to show the world God and his goodness and bring people into the covenant. And so Paul is going to then be fairly firm with them. And he's going to tell them that you boast about being circumcised. You boast about having the Mosaic law. Because the Jew, Jewish Christians in this community are boasting. Well, you know, we're, we're better Christians because we come from this lineage of being Jews. We have the kosher laws, the Mosaic law, and circumcision, and the patriarchs, Isaac, and, and Jacob, and Abraham, and Moses. Paul's going to say, you boast about these things, but you're not faithful. And he's going to tell them in verse 28, this is going to hit the Jewish people pretty hard. He's going to say, For he is not a real Jew who is one outwardly, nor is true circumcision something external and physical. He is a Jew who is one inwardly, and real circumcision is a matter of the heart. It's spiritual, not literal. So he's going to tell them that you may think you're a faithful Jew because you've been circumcised, but the faithful Jew is one who's interiorly transformed. This is the message Jesus was also bringing. And then he's going to go into chapter 3. And it, and just before he does this too, he's going to, he's basically what he's saying is these works of law can't save you. He's going to just remember verse, chapter 1, verse 5, it's an obedience of faith. But And then he's going to show, because they're going to say, um, he's going to anticipate that they're saying, well, but if, if, I'm in the, sorry, if I'm in the covenant with God and he's not going to save me, then God's being unfaithful. I'm in covenant. I'm circumcised. I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to follow the kosher laws and all these other laws. But if, if, if God's not going to save me, isn't he being unfaithful? And Paul's going to tell them, being unfaithful, God is being faithful by punishing you. Because God is always faithful. It's us who are unfaithful. And if we've broken the covenant and broken the law, then in God's faithfulness to this covenant, in justice, we deserve to be punished. We deserve the punishment of death. So he's going to start to emphasize that in chapter 3. And so he's going to say that just because God is faithful to the covenant doesn't mean that he's going to save sinners. If we break the covenant, we deserve to be punished. And so he's going to basically tell them, even though we have the law, we haven't been faithful. So there's no room for boasting. The real Jew is the one who's circumcised of the heart, this interior transformation. And so Paul has given us all this bad news. Both Jew and Gentile, we're all sinners. You know, we all have this problem of sin in our lives and unfaithfulness and disobedience. So what now? And then Paul's going to give the solution to the problem, the good news. So in chapter 3, verse 21 through chapter 4, he's going to talk about the solution. And the solution is the righteousness of God. And so what Paul's going to start telling us in chapter 3, verse 21, is this righteousness of God is the, is the solution. This is the good news. Okay, and this righteousness of God is God's faithfulness to the covenant. And because of his faithfulness to humanity, he sent Christ. And it's going to be Jesus Christ who's going to show us how God ultimately is, is, is so unconditionally loving to humanity because of what he does. God has a solution. The solution is Christ. So the good news is that God is righteous. And this wrath of God is going to be... I guess, opposed, in a sense, by the good news of Christ. And so what he's going to tell them is that the righteousness of God has been manifested to us. In chapter 3, verse 22. The righteousness of God has been manifested through, to us through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. So this faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe is how God manifests his righteousness. He'll tell us there's no distinction, Jew or, Jew or Gentile, for all who believe they will see this, this manifestation. And so here is starting to get into a confusing section because what does it mean whenever he says that the righteousness of God is manifested through faith in Jesus Christ? So does he mean that all we have to do is have faith, faith alone? Well, in most Bible translations, this is what it says is through faith in Jesus Christ. But what many scholars today are starting to teach us is that the better translation of this passage is actually it can be translated through faith in Jesus Christ but the better translation may be through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ because what Paul is trying to say is that God's righteousness is manifested to us 
through Jesus Christ and what he did. And it was Jesus Christ's faithfulness and obedience until the end that shows us God's love. And so, um, without going into any kind of scholarly exegesis about this, I, Dr. Tim Gray and many of the current scholars have taught that the righteousness, of, the righteousness of God is manifested through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ for all who believe. And so Jesus Christ comes, what he does is open to all people, Jew and Gentile, men and women, slave or free, it's all available to all. And then he's going to show that all humanity has now been redeemed Verse 24, through the sacrifice of Christ. And as a result, grace is now possible to all. Because he says that in verse 24, they are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption which is in Jesus Christ. And this is to show God's righteousness. And then we can skip down. um, So basically saying all have sinned. It's through Christ's faithfulness with his death on the cross that shows God's faithfulness to humanity. God loved us all so much he sent Christ and then through Christ all are redeemed and then grace is made available to all. And and in this passage right here he's going to say it's grace that justifies us. So if we have grace we're justified. And we're going to see this term a lot. Justified means being made right before God. Being made pleasing to God. So So justification or being justified is going from a state of unrighteousness to a state of righteousness. From being unpleasing to pleasing. And so we do have initial justification that happens at baptism when grace is received and then there's this process throughout our life we're justified, process of it, this progressive justification. But not to get too off tangent, so he's talking about that grace justifies us because Christ made it available to all. The key thing I want to talk about though is verse 27. So this is where Martin Luther started to have some problems. So Martin Luther already thinks that God, his righteousness is made avail- is made known to us through the through faith in Jesus. So he started starting to think, okay, well, faith alone, we just need faith through Jesus. And then in verse 26, it was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous, that God is righteous, and that he that God justifies him who has faith in Jesus. So he repeated this twice, that faith in Jesus is what justifies us. So Martin Luther, who he's very scrupulous, he has um, a lot of sins, he sees mankind as just being wretched, and there's no way we can be transformed. Um, And so he says, you know what? Paul is teaching all we need is faith. So we just need faith alone. And so Martin Luther would say, grace saves us. We just have to have faith. And so if we're in Christ and we have faith, then it doesn't matter how we live. And Martin Luther's words were, if you're you're saved, you, you have faith in Jesus, then sin and sin boldly because it doesn't matter. We have faith in Jesus. That's all we need. God justifies us through this faith. Because he read this verse 26 and said, ah, see? We're justified. God justifies him who has faith in Jesus. All we need is faith alone. But if he had read the next few verses of St. Paul and understood what St. Paul was saying, he would see that he misunderstood. Because Paul is going to kind of counter that exact interpretation. Now, um, this idea of being saved by faith alone was invented by Martin Luther. No one had believed it before then. So Paul isn't writing to present-day Protestants to try to counter their arguments, but he does show us Um, a way to kind of counter that and defend it in verse 27 and following. Because now he says that God manifests his righteousness through Christ. If you have faith in Jesus, then you can be justified. Then he's going to say in verse 27, talking to the Jewish people, then what becomes of our boasting? Because the Jews are boasting. They're boasting about the Mosaic law and being circumcised. What becomes of our boasting? Now before we continue, almost every translation that I've seen has a little bit of an inaccurate translation. So anywhere you see the word principle, if that's in your translation, it shouldn't be principle. The Greek word is nomos. I think I have it on here. Nomos. So the best translation is law, not principle. And so I think it's going to make much more sense to read this as saying what Paul actually was saying. Law, not principle. Because principle is a little confusing. So he's going to say to the Jewish Christians, what is our boasting? They're boasting Mosaic law. So can he says, then what of our boasting? It is excluded. We can no longer boast. Okay, why? Why can we no longer boast? On what law? On the law of works? No. You say no, not on the law of works, because that's no longer necessary. So what so what is our boasting excluded of? Is because it's on the law of faith. So here we see this phrase, the law of faith, just like we saw in Galatians, 
chapter 6, verse 2, the law of Christ. Here in, in Romans, he's calling it the law of faith. Because he's saying that our boasting is excluded because now we have the law of faith that we're all under. Okay, so then in verse 28, Paul's going to say, For we hold that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Martin Luther actually added the word alone in this passage because he wanted to emphasize that he knows what Paul means, that the, the Catholic Church doesn't, that they mis, misunderstood. So he's going to say, For we hold that man is justified by faith, Martin Luther put by faith alone, apart from the works of the law. But that's not what Paul says. Paul's not saying we're justified by faith alone. He's saying we're justified by faith apart from the works of the law, the Mosaic law. So it's faith now in our relationship with Christ in this, in this faith, not the Mosaic law. And the reason we know Paul doesn't mean that because we can look to verse 31. Because Paul's going to answer that question. Because he says, Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? Paul says, By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So now there's this law that we must uphold. We must have faith, but now there's also this law of faith. Our faith is attached to this law of faith. And we must uphold it. Now, Paul is going to spend several more chapters in, in Romans before he tells us what this means. What do we mean? We must uphold the law. So we're going to kind of cheat for a second and jump ahead and see what Paul means. So if you jump to chapter 13, he spends a lot of time showing them a lot of this, and then he'll show them at the end how it is we uphold the law. So he's showing we don't need the Mosaic law. We just need faith. We're justified by faith apart from the Mosaic law. But this doesn't mean we overthrow law. We uphold the law. In chapter 13, verse 10, love, he's talking about love. Love does no, no wrong to the neighbor. He's been talking about love several verses before. And then he says, therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So again, just like he did in Galatians, um, Galatians chapter 5 and chapter 6, he shows us this law of faith, this law of Christ is fulfilled in love. Love must go along with this faith. And that's why in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, he said, faith working through love. That's how we live. That's how we live in this new covenant, is faith working through love. So here he'll tell us this law of faith is upheld. The fulfillment of it is love. We must uphold the law. So it's not faith alone. It's faith working through love. And so this is what exactly what the Catholic Church means when we say faith and works. It doesn't mean we're earning our salvation. It means we're upholding this law, this law of faith. Faith and works, works go together, this charity. And so St. James, when he writes his letter, he'll say that faith without works is dead because St. James is talking about this love that we have to have. Faith without love is dead. We cannot have faith without upholding this law of faith that's fulfilled in love. So grace is a gift because of Christ's sacrifice. It's nothing we deserved, but because of God's love and mercy, Christ came and died for us and made grace available. And then... Because of Christ, we can enter into this new covenant, unite ourselves to Christ through baptism, receive this free gift of grace, and then cooperate with this grace and have faith and love. And by, by loving, we're upholding the law of faith that's a part of this new covenant, the law of the new covenant. Okay, we can flip back now to chapter 3 again real quick. Now, again, this is all kind of going with his inclusio, that key phrase, obedience of faith. This is all kind of, you can see how this all kind of goes hand in hand. This law of faith exists. Now, in chapter 4, he's going to talk again about Abraham. And we're not going to spend time on it because we talked about it with Galatians, but he's going to emphasize again. Abraham, it wasn't his circumcision that saved him. It was his faith and obedience. It was not his circumcision, but his faith. And so he's saying, so now too with us. Just like Abraham, it was his faith and obedience that made him in covenant with God, so now too with us. It's our faith and obedience. Again, remember the obedience of faith. And then in chapter 5, verse 12, we're going to talk about Adam and Christ. Let's skip to that. So Christ, Paul shows Christ is the new Adam. So we're going to read a little small section of this. He's going to show Christ is the new Adam. Verse 12, Therefore as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, 
because all men sinned. Sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Jump to verse 15. But the free gift is not like the trespass. And trespass means sin. So that, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ. And the free gift is not like the effect of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trans- trespasses brings justification. So he's going to kind of go back and forth. If you read the rest of the section, he's going to go back and forth. What Adam did, what the new Adam did. What the Adam did, what the new Adam did. And so he's going to show that through one man, Adam, Adam sinned and was disobedient. Sin enters the world. Condemnation and death come to all. Through one man, Christ, the new Adam, his act of righteousness, his obedience, brings redemption for all. And it brings this free gift of grace offered to all. And so grace... Grace makes eternal life possible. Okay, so he's going to show this kind of back and forth. He's going to talk about sin and how it reigns and this kingdom of sin. And then Christ will bring grace. And now we're free to kind of live in this this new kingdom. Obedience, righteousness, contrasted with sin and disobedience. So this kind of contrast between Adam and the new Adam and what took place. Okay, so that's the rest of chapter 5. And so then that's going to lead Paul to say in chapter 6... What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Because Paul has now talked about how great grace is now available to everybody. So Paul is anticipating the question, okay, great, we have grace available, so can we just continue to sin and that will bring more grace upon me? And Paul's saying, no, um, it's not okay to sin. So he's going to basically say, um, don't, in other places, like in chapter 3 earlier, he would have said, don't do evil so that good may come of it. Don't presume on God's kindness. He said this earlier in chapter 2. And then in chapter 6, he's going to say, don't let sin reign within you and have control. So just because we have grace doesn't mean we can live however we want. Okay, so we're going to look at this. So chapter 3, I mean chapter 6, verse 3. So um, he says, what shall we, I'll start at the beginning, chapter, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our former man was crucified with him, so that the sinful body might be destroyed, and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. So he's showing this through baptism we're united to Christ. We're baptized, we enter into his death so that we can rise to new life like Christ did. We can enter into this, we can receive this gift of grace and we can crucify our old man, our old self. Yes, we can do, it says so our sinful body might be destroyed. This idea of we have the ability to be transformed now through baptism, through grace, so that we can no longer be enslaved to sin. We're going to jump to verse 11. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Verse 12, this is going to show us that just because we've been baptized and received grace doesn't mean that's the end. doesn't mean we're automatically now saved and can, it, and can inherit eternal life. Because he says in verse 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. Do not yield your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but yield yourselves to God as men who have been brought from death to life. And your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Okay? You're no, and and he's, when he talks about law here, he's talking about the law of sin. Okay? So you're now under this law of grace. But grace doesn't coerce you and force you to do the right thing. You have to, to cooperate with it. If you cooperate fully with it, it's going to let you live the way God calls you to live. But we have to ha- there's this battle. There's this, are we going to let sin reign? Or are we going to let grace reign? Which one's going to have dominion over us? And so he's going to talk about this spiritual battle that we have throughout the rest of our life. We can, just because we have grace doesn't mean we're automatically saved. We have to make sure we're not obeying our passions. Make sure we're not giving in to sin and obeying wickedness. That's what he's saying in that little passage.
then this is where in chapter 6, verse 16, Do you not know that if you yield yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you're slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? So he's talking about this idea of slave. Remember in chapter chapter 1, verse 1, he's a slave of Christ. He's calling us to be the sla- that slave as well. But we still could choose to be slaves of, slaves of sin and continue to fall into that way of life, even with grace. But grace makes it possible that if we cooperate with it, we can be slaves of Christ, slaves of obedience and righteousness. And then I'll tell them in verse 17, chapter 6, verse 17, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. So he's showing them, he's kind of giving them praise, these Christians. He's upbuilding them, saying, Thanks be to God, you're not giving in to sin. You're being obedient to God. And he shows us there's, there's this teaching we have to be obedient to. So again, this idea, it's not just faith and this intellectual assent. There's this teaching we have to be faithful to. Um, in the Greek, it's the word uh, didache right here. The standard of teaching is didache, which means catechesis. Okay, so there's this teaching that you've been committed to. So he's saying, thanks be to God that you've given, that you've committed to this. And then here in chapter 7, we're not going to get to it, but he's going to read about how the Mosaic law is no longer binding. He's going to use the example of marriage that we talked about earlier um, with Galatians. Okay, so he's going to talk about this. The Mosaic law is no longer binding because they're going to have this issue with thinking that it still is. So you're called to an obedience of faith. So in chapter 7, verse 1, we're not going to read this section, but he's going to be speaking to the Jews and tell them you don't have to live by the Mosaic law. It's no longer binding, using the example of marriage. Okay, and so then in chapter 7, verse 25, he's going to tell them, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, because we are no longer enslaved to sin. We now have grace that's now given to us. Sin doesn't work in us. This sin that we know dwells within us, grace can overcome that. And in chapter 8 is a very key chapter. Because he says that we are now no longer, we're now under the new Adam, we're in Christ. We're no longer slaves to sin. Grace sets us free. And then in chapter 8, verse 2, for the law of the Spirit. So there's another, this, another term for the same law. We've heard law of Christ, law of faith, there's law of grace, now the law of the Spirit. Has set me free from the law of sin and death. Okay. And then he's going to say, in this key passage, in chapter 8, He's going to tell us that chapter 8, verse 4. So we're at now we're, let me read verse 2 again. For the law of the Spirit has set me free from the law of sin and death. I'll just read chapter, verse 3. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. It's the Mosaic law. Could not save me. Could not enable me to be obedient. Okay, it says, for, for God has now done in the new covenant what the old covenant couldn't do. Because now he's given me grace. And so he says in in verse 4, In order that the just requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So again, this idea there is still a law, and grace now makes it possible for us to fulfill it. We can now live up to the requirements of the law because of grace. So it's not faith alone. It's this faith plus this law of faith that we must abide by. But it's now possible. In verse 4 he tells us the just requirements of the law so the requirements of the law can be fulfilled in us because of grace. We can be faithful. So he's going to tell them like in verse 13. Uh, let's see. Let me skip to that point. Um, well, before we get to verse 13, just real briefly, verse 6. Remember in chapter 1 what happens if you don't worship God and set your mind on truth and, and, and then obey that truth. In verse 6 he's going to say, To set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh, like fleshly things, created things, the creatures, it's hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, and indeed it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So he's showing them this connection again between the mind and the heart. We must be set our minds on God and on truth so that our heart and our will can follow and obey God. Because if it's hostile to God or turned against God, we can't be faithful. And then he's going to tell them in, let's see, verse 13. 
for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. And again, he's talking to the Christians. He's not just saying some non-Christian. He's saying to the Christians. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. So if you don't walk in this way of the Spirit, you're not going to inherit this, this promise of eternal life. So if you, walk, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, then you will put to death the deeds of the body, and you will live. So again, it's this idea of this spiritual battle. You're going to be putting to death these things over your life. It's going to be this constant battle, kind of suppressing these desires and these fleshly things, these passions that aren't um, in accord with God's will. Throughout your life, be working, fighting this battle. And then those, in four, verse 14, those who are led by the Spirit are, of God are sons of God. And then he says that we're in end of chapter, uh, verse 15, we have the spirit of sonship. He's going to talk about our inheritance. And in verse 17, if we are children of God, then we're heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So he's going to say that if we have faith and are obedient to Christ and are faithful to this covenant, then we too will receive this inheritance of glory, but this will come with suffering. This isn't going to be a cakewalk. It's not going to be this life where we can avoid things. If Christ suffered, we are intimately united to him. We too will suffer. So in verse 17, if we are fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him. We're going to suffer. We should embrace the suffering because it unites us to Christ. Um, but because we have grace, we'll be able to endure this and withstand this. And the rest of chapter 8, he's going to talk about suffering. We're not going to talk about that section, but he's going to talk about suffering. And think what's going to happen in a, in a few years, probably in less than 10 years. This is around the mid-50s. What's going to happen in 10 years to the Roman Christians? The Emperor Nero is going to come into power, and what's going to happen? He's going to torture and persecute and kill many of these people he's writing to. So Paul already knows, he's already been persecuted. We read about all the times he was stoned and beaten and imprisoned. Paul knows what's happened himself. He knows what's going to happen to these Romans. He's going to tell them that embrace this suffering. It unites us to Christ, and God is going to give you the grace to overcome it and to withstand it. Um, Don't let the suffering you may experience make you fall into despair. Because God will not abandon you if you don't abandon Him. If you stay in God's grace and in God's love, God will not abandon you. Even if I walk away from God, God still doesn't abandon me. He continues to call out and reach out. It's me who's rejecting God. It's not God who's rejecting me. So Paul will kind of emphasize that through the rest of chapter 8. We're called to be sons of Christ and heirs. This is going to mean having faith and being obedient. And also know that will come with suffering. In the last couple of minutes, we're going to try to wrap up these last couple chapters um, in Romans just a little bit. In chapter 9, Paul's going to express, he's kind of frustrated because the Jews, uh, particularly not the Jewish Christians, but the Jews are, aren't converting. They're not seeing Christ as the Messiah. So he's going to express a little bit of his anguish with that. He's, he's just upset that the Jews who had been given everything failed to see the Messiah. So he's going to talk about that a little bit in chapter 9. Um, But then he's going to also talk about, in chapter 9, that um, God's plan is that we are to be conformed to Christ. But if if we resist God, then we're taking ourselves out of God's plan. It's not God's plan that's the problem, it's us. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, we're going to skip to chapter 11. And in chapter 11, starting with like around verse 17... This is the analogy of the olive tree with the root and the branches, and he's going to show, um, particularly the Gentile Christians at this point, um, he's going to say, basically he's going to be using the analogy that Jesus is our root and that we're the branches, and that the Jewish people are the natural branches. The Jewish Christians, they're the natural branches, because that is the root of the faith, is this Jewish faith. They're the natural branches, but there have been Gentiles who have been grafted in. There are these wild... um, wild olive branches that have been grafted in. So now we have the root, it's Jesus, with both natural branches and then the wild roots, the wild branches that are grafted into the root. And these are the Gentiles and the Jews. Now they're all Christian, all united to Christ. But Paul's going to show them that there have been some Jews who have been cut off because they didn't persevere in faith and obedience. So he's going to tell the Jew- Gentile Christians that I'm telling the Jewish Christians not to boast about their heritage. I'm also not going to tell you don't boast just because now you too have been grafted into the root. Because just like those Jews who have been cut off because, they, because of their disbelief 
and their disobedience, you too can be cut off. She's going to warn the Gentile Christians that if you're unfaithful and disobedient, you too can be cut off. We can see that in verse 22, explicitly explicitly where he warns them that Jesus is the root and we want to stay united to him, but it is possible if we don't persevere that we can be cut off. Then in, um, my slides are right behind. Then in chapter 12, he's going to, to exhort them to live faithfully. And so in chapter 1, chapter 12, verse 1, I appeal to you. He's exhorting to all the Christians in Rome. He's going to exhort them. And he's going to tell them to present their bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of of your mind. So again, he's going to emphasize what he'd emphasized in chapter 1 and then just a few moments ago, that our mind must be oriented to truth and oriented to God. Otherwise, we will start falling into this downward spiral. Um, We must be conformed to Christ and not to the world. We must have a change of mind and be focused on the truth and worship God, not the creatures. And he's going to basically tell them that the heart and mind are deeply connected and what we worship what we hold to be of the greatest value in our lives, what we love the most, is going to influence the way we live. It's going to determine how we think, how we act, what we obey and disobey, what we love and what we worship, what we hold to be the greatest value. And if it's anything other than God, it's distorted. And if if anything in your life, if God is not central in your life, if your life isn't directed to God, you're going to fall into this distorted reality, this illusion, and it's going to lead you astray. It's going to make you fall into futile thinking, and, and your hearts will be darkened like we talked about in chapter 1. So he's going to call them, be conformed to Christ, not to the world. Transform yourselves. Have a renewal of your mind. Be oriented in the right direction to God. Worship God above all things, and that way you can be united to truth, and then that way you can live faithfully. And then in... Uh, Chapter 12, verse 9, he's going to show them the marks of a true Christian, what it looks like to be faithful. And he's going to talk about, let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another. Verse 12, rejoice in your hope and be patient in tribulation. So kind of endure suffering. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Reject the, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony. So he's showing them how, what it looks like to be faithful and to live according to how Christ calls us to live. He's going to tell them through the rest of chapter 12 and 13 that love is so important. We must reject immorality. We must love our enemies. We must be lights to the world. He's going to show that Christianity is not merely being about, it's not merely about being good. It's about conforming to Christ and imitating Christ. And then this is really radical. This is radically hard and radically difficult, as we all know. Because he's calling every single one of us to come out of Adam and enter into the new Adam. Come out into this life, this way that's easy, into this radically difficult life, but that's possible now because of grace. So it's this supernatural calling that he's calling all of us. We cannot do this without God's grace. We rely on God's grace. We must be led by the Spirit and led by this grace. And then that's when he comes to chapter 13, verse 10, that we must uphold this law, and this law is fulfilled in love. So we must love. And he's going to kind of exhort them in verse 11 that be alert, be awake, cast off darkness, put on Christ, transform your lives. So that the rest of chapter 13 is talking about that. Always be alert, waking up, realize the situation, the seriousness of how, how we're choosing to live. Because every single day, we're going to be making choices to put on Christ or to, to kind of follow the ways of the old man, to live in darkness or live in light, to transform our, our minds and our hearts to Christ or to conform to the world. Every day, we're going to have this battle within us that we have to be aware of and be alert to. And so he's going to tell them that in the rest of chapter 13. And then we're going to skip chapter 14. He's going to talk a little bit about the tensions in Rome that we already talked about with some of the meat and the feast days and some of the fights they're having amongst themselves. He's going to say this dissension, this tension is tearing up the community because it goes against charity. And then he's going to end this letter um, in chapter 16, which is greetings, um, telling them what he's going to be doing. He's about to, in the end of chapter 15, he's going to talk about his plans and what's going to happen. He hopes to come visit them. 
chapter 16, he's going to get some greetings from different people that he knows. Some are in Rome, and he's just w- telling them, you know, wishing them well, and he's, he's telling people you know, different greetings. And then he's going to end it in chapter 16. So his final appeal is going to be around verse 17. He's going to sum up what he's just written about. I appeal to you, brethren, take note of those who create dissensions and difficulties in opposition to the doctrine which you have been taught. Avoid them. They do not serve the Lord, but their own appetites. And by fair and flattering words, they deceive the hearts of the simple-minded. For while your obedience is known to all, so I rejoice over you, I would have you wise as to what is good and guileless as to what is evil. And then the God of peace will soon crush Satan. And the grace of the Lord be with you. And then skip down to verse 26. He's going to say that he's writing to make known to uh, to, to make known to them that he wants to bring about an obedience of faith. So again, he's going to call them that this is all about bringing about an obedience of faith. It's not just faith alone. It's not the Mosaic law. It's this obedience of faith, and and that we, you know, basically summarizing that little inclusio, the beginning and end of the letter, um, so with this obedience of faith at the heart of his message. Um, that this faith we're called to now in the new covenant um, is this obedience of faith. But what that means is that we must love. And that love is the fulfillment of, this, the, of the law and that grace, our cooperation with that grace, makes it possible. Can you um, expound a little bit on the first sentence of chapter 16? Okay. Okay. So I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deaconess of the church. Mm-hmm. Where is it? Um, it's near, so near Corinth, that... Um, word that I can't really Sincrae mm-hmm. I don't know how to pronounce it but it's kind of the port of Corinth um, so at the time they might have had women who were at, they weren't or, deaconesses weren't ordained but they were women who were helping um, with their ministries and so um, from what I've been told is this church at that location is near is at the port of Corinth so near where the, in Corinth with the Corinthians um, and so he's, send, he's likely sending her to Rome and she may have even been one of the people bringing the letter, possibly. So, I mean, um, most of the time when he lists all these names, they're not insignificant. Um, and so it's people they all would have recognized or known. And maybe this might have been one of the people bringing the letter because he says, I commend to you, our sister Phoebe. So I bet he's sending her with this letter to them, along with other people. And he's asking them to receive her um, with this letter. Yeah, before the Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They're different than deacons because they're not ordained, but they were helping. They'd assist in the ministries, and especially like at baptisms because they'd be nude. They'd be naked, so they didn't want the men, the deacon men, helping the women. So you'd have a deaconess helping the women and then be in a separate location kind of with little things setting them off so you can't see each other because you would enter the baptismal font. I mean, the tradition in the tradition of early church, you would enter and take off all your clothes because you're putting off the old man. You would go into the water naked, and you'd be dying, and you and and whether it's whether it's poured or immersed, depending on the location, would determine what they could do. Whether or not you went under the water three times, or just had water poured over you, um, then you would come out of the font, and then they put a white robe, signifying this new man in Christ. The, mm-hmm, you're putting on Christ, and so then they would go, and so because they were nude, then they would also have the the women assisting the women, and the the deacons assisting the men. So it'd be kind of this, kind of more of just kind of a um, more of a just because of the times and what they were doing, the women were important in that role to help with that. So, um, yeah, I'm not real sure. I mean, I think it was there for the first several hundred years, but I don't know exactly when they started not making it kind of literally this um, expression. Mm-hmm. Another key point that I wasn't going to necessarily mention because of time, but we can since you brought up her name. But in verse 13, where it says Greek Rufus. Rufus was the son of Simon of Cyrene that helped carry Jesus' his cross. Mm-hmm. Because in Mark's gospel, he tells us that. Mark's gospel told us but that Simon of Cyrene had sons. I think it's in Mark's gospel, but that Rufus. And then it's obvious that Rufus must be very close to Paul because he says, Greet Rufus, eminent in the Lord, and also his mother and mine. So Paul relates to Rufus' his mother very deeply and intensely that he's even saying... His mother is basically like my mother, because um, they weren't literally brothers, um, but he obviously has a very close relationship with Simon of Cyrene's wife. 
But all names are important. It's just we don't always know the significance of them. But at the time, the Christians would have absolutely known who these people were. Um, and in verse 3, you see Priscilla and Aquila. So they're back in Rome because he says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow co-workers in Christ, who risked their necks for my life. So they've obviously gone back to Rome. So he's writing this letter saying, Greet them. So all these different people. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Mary was fairly common, so we don't we don't know. But the community reading the letter, they would have known particularly who this Mary was. So I don't know because she obviously was working hard among them. So she probably was one of the evangelists and uh, potentially, but she's doing some type of work among them. Any other questions? I know that Romans is a little confusing, so hopefully we at least help, I helped you kind of start to at least see some of these things, and you can read it again maybe and bring out some, some more of these details with Paul. But it is very, he's very deep with his theology, and so you have to, you know, he can say a few sentences, and we being 2,000 years later don't always understand the significance. But at the time, those Christians, especially the Jewish Christians, would have deeply understood what he, what he means by a few words. He brings up Abraham, they would have known. You know, he brings, he quotes the Old Testament. They would have known. For us, it's a little harder. We don't always catch those connections, but. All right, any other questions? No? All right, well, we'll finish up tomorrow with Corinthians and Ephesians. Um, Ephesians isn't too long if you wanted to read that one. Um, 1 Corinthians is very good. There's a few sections of it that are really powerful about the Eucharist, like chapters 10 and 11. Um, so if you wanted to read some parts of Corinthians, maybe, just to see kind of what we're going to be covering a little bit tomorrow. Um, but 10 and 11 in Corinthians are very strong on the Eucharist, um, what Paul teaches about that. But Ephesians is a beautiful, beautiful letter, and it's not too long, so you may want to read that for tomorrow. I'll leave it up to you. But we'll cover 1 Corinthians and Ephesians tomorrow, and Paul's teaching on the church. All right, thanks.